Iran is a distant land, halfway around the globe from the United States. Nevertheless, its security is a vital concern to our government. As a member of CENTO, the Central Treaty Organization, Iran is an important link in the defense of the free world. She shares a 1,400-mile border with neighboring Russia, who has for centuries sought a warm water port in the area. Although Iran has a fine army with a good morale and high level of training, she would require immediate assistance from her allies in case of invasion by numerically superior forces. In order to prove the feasibility of airborne support should such an eventuality occur, the United States and Iranian forces under CENTO auspices planned a joint exercise called Delawar. This successful, far-reaching exercise is the first of its kind on this scale. As Cyrus the Younger said, my father's kingdom extends far to the south where man cannot live because of the heat, and northward to where he cannot live because of extreme cold. This proud boast is still almost as true today in Iran as it was at the time the country bore the name Persia. High mountains, green valleys, and vast desert areas make up the land of Iran. Here is the scene of one of the world's earliest civilizations and the archaeological remains of once great kingdoms which flourished in the ancient world. In ancient times, even as today, Iran's strategic position has tempted invaders and covetous neighbors. During recent years, Iran's armed forces have been supplied and trained by the United States as a rampart of the freedom-loving world. 6,000 years of recorded history were to be part of the setting for the combined U.S.-Iranian military exercise, Delawar. The planning nerve center for the United States portion of exercise Delawar was located at MacDill Air Force Base, Florida. General Paul D. Adams commanded all United States forces participating in the exercise, with the exception of Matt's airlift forces. Command of these forces was retained by the Matt's commander. At Cannon Air Force Base in New Mexico, fighter pilots were briefed on their tactical support mission. Two squadrons of F-100 Super Sabres were assigned to the Delaware operation. 88 United States-based transports provided the airlift requirements necessary to move an airborne brigade 8,000 miles to its destination. At Fort Campbell, Kentucky, the 101st Airborne Division, the Screaming Eagles, supplied an airborne brigade for a joint task force designed to demonstrate our ability to come quickly to the aid of a friendly Middle East country. Delawar is a Persian word meaning courageous, for which the fighting men of the 101st are famous. Mats, the military air transport service airlifted a reinforced brigade from Fort Campbell to Iran. In addition, 550 tons of cargo were transported in order to equip and supply the approximately 2,300 airborne troops involved in the exercise. Giant transports lowered their ramps to take in the necessary work tools of today's modern fighting man. Jeeps, artillery, communications equipment, all were loaded in record time. These items of military material traveled thousands of air miles 
together with the soldiers who would use them, effectively demonstrating to our friends and other nations the mobility of the United States Armed Forces. Also present at all times during the Delaware exercise was the supersonic firepower of the supporting tactical fighters. Strategic Air Command KC-135 jet tankers refueled the TAC fighters en route from the United States to Iran. In Chile, a base of Cento member Turkey was the first stop for the battle group on their global trek. At Incirlik Air Base, elements of the Delaware operation awaited the D-Day go order. The troops remained on the alert during their stay by tough battle conditioning exercises. <laughs> Of course, like soldiers everywhere, time was found for that moment of relaxation and a chance to nourish the inner man. Meanwhile, in neighboring Iran, elements of the Iranian Royal Guard, assisted by their United States military advisors, staged a warm-up paradrop. Iranian flight crews and airborne officers went over the operation plan and pinpointed the drop zone area. The confidence and skill of these men testified to their qualifications as paratroopers and reflected the excellent training given them. Now, all was in readiness for the exercise itself. On D-Day, the Airborne Brigade took off from Incirlik, flying through the narrow corridor between Turkey and northwest Iran. The brigade then conducted a parachute assault near Dezful. Later during D-Day, a Navy force conducted an amphibious assault on Karg Island in the Persian Gulf. Both the Airborne and amphibious assaults were supported by jet fighters. In Iran, Exercise Delaware's nerve center was Vadati Air Base. Among the first to land at Vadati were transport carrying the Joint Task Force staff. Communications equipment and personnel also arrived on these aircraft. Setting up their gear with the speed and skill that come only from long hours of training, a communications network was soon established. The first combat elements to arrive in Iran were the F-100s, which landed at Vadati with routine precision despite blowing dust that hampered visibility. United States and Iranian Air Force officers were on hand to observe the landings. Also on hand for the big picture was Sergeant Major Donald Cosgrove. We're down on the flight line here at Vaudity Air Force Base, and while we have some time prior to the massive airdrop taking place, we're going to speak to a couple of the military personnel involved in Exercise Delaware. One of the most interesting things about this exercise is that for every American participating, he has his Iranian counterpart. In just a few moments, this F-86 fighter jet behind me will be taking off as a part of the air cover for the airdrop. And I have standing to my right a second lieutenant jet pilot of the Imperial Iranian Air Force. This is second lieutenant Hejazi. And Lieutenant Hejazi, I would like to ask you now how you feel about being able to take part in an exercise with American pilots. 
Well, I'd like very much to take this uh, exercise, and uh, I think this flight with the American will bring me some memory from uh, my flying time in the United States. And where did you do your flying, sir, in the United States? Well, I got my primary and basic training out of uh, Reese Air Force Base, Lubbock, Texas, and my gunnery training out of Neros Air Force Base, Las Vegas, Nevada. Lieutenant, I must say I noticed one thing about you. You speak very good English. Did you have to take any uh, language training? Uh, I got some, um, about uh, four months of language training out of Lackland Air Force Base, San Antonio, Texas. And now we'll have a few words with the gentleman to my left. This is Major Stallings. And Major Stallings, how do you like being here halfway around the world taking part in Exercise Delaware? Well, Sergeant, it's a real fine opportunity for me because one of the jet pilots in the lieutenant squadron is an old student of mine from the United States. On D-Day, just before H hour of the first airdrop in Exercise Delaware, His Imperial Majesty Reza Shah Pahlavi arrived at the reviewing stand with his staff and aides. Among dignitaries were representatives of the other Cento countries, England, Pakistan, and Turkey, observing an exercise designed to prove the effectiveness of Cento member armed forces. At exactly H hour, the first wave of planes was seen over the drop zone. The heavy equipment was dropped first. Then paratroopers of the 101st jumped into the desert some nine miles north of the Iranian city of Dezbul. With perfect military precision, the clusters of chutes filled the sky in this first jump of the three-day Delaware exercise. Once on the ground, the soldiers scrambled for their equipment, regrouped, and later joined their Iranian comrades in arms holding a line to the north. After the drop, Sergeant Major Cosgrove talked with the exercise commander. General Adams, I'm happy to say that once again our paths cross, only this time halfway around the world, sir, in Iran. In addition to the command I just mentioned, General Adams has another command. And General, will you explain briefly what is that command? What does it involve? It involves the military, U.S. military responsibilities in what we call the Miasa area, that is the Middle East, South Asia, and Africa south of the Sahara. In discharging these responsibilities, all of our military activities are brought under one single commander. This exercise is under my command because I bring the forces over put them into the exercise and turn them over to the combined commander who conducts the operation here. General, you have had the opportunity to meet and talk with His Imperial Majesty Mohammad Reza Shah Pahlavi. Uh, what were the Shah's impressions of Exercise Delaware? So far, the Shah has expressed great pleasure over what has taken place in the exercise. Just a few moments ago, he turned to me and said, that is a very precise drop indeed. And there was enthusiasm in the manner in which he expressed himself. Sir, do you feel this exercise will have uh, some kind of an impact on the Iranian army and, in fact, on the Iranian people? I think that any strong common endeavor between two people does have a large impact. The impact that I've observed is one of friendliness to start with but most importantly is that we are learning how to work with the Iranian armed forces as a combined joint team engaged in a common enterprise. With this teamwork, if we should ever have to operate together, our strength will be multiplied. As the first airborne assault was successfully concluded, the Shah left the stands in order to follow the action as it developed. He boarded a jeep and headed a convoy of dignitaries to watch the combined exercise involving United States and Iranian ground forces. We 
are now 250 miles, or as they would say in this part of the world, about 400 kilometers from Vodity Air Force Base. It is a sunshiny, but still breezy day, as we stand on this hill, overlooking the blue waters of the Persian Gulf. It is still D-Day, H-hour plus three to be exact, and the amphibious assault on Karg Island is well underway. This operation is still a part of Exercise Delaware and is designed to point up the ability of the United States military establishment to deliver amphibious support to our allies if and when they should ever call for it. A United States Naval Force consisting of one LSD, two destroyers, one reinforced marine company and eight helicopters took part in the action. The United States and Iranian naval forces in the Persian Gulf launched an amphibious attack on the beaches of Karg Island. Their mission, to clear the island of enemy insurgents. As the landing craft hit the beach, United States Marines stormed ashore. Other Marines were airlifted by helicopters. The choppers contributed their share to the success of the operation. Use of helicopters greatly increased tactical mobility and enabled the troops to move over terrain obstacles such as beaches, rivers, and mountains. Heavy equipment was transported in a similar manner. Once again, the Shah and his staff and the official observers witnessed firsthand this valuable training exercise. The landing forces were recovered from Karg Island at the conclusion of the operation, and within days would conduct another combined amphibious assault in the Persian Gulf area. It is now D-Day plus two of Exercise Delaware, and we have returned to the western desert area of Iran. This is Captain Paul Weinman, United States Army Airborne Special Forces Advisor to the Imperial Iranian Army, speaking to you from Drop Zone Hawk, located somewhere in western Iran. I have just parachuted from an American Air Force C-130 aircraft with a Pathfinder, or as the Air Force says, a combat control team onto this DZ, onto DZ Hawk, for the purposes of laying communications and navigational aids for six American C-130 aircraft, which within a few moments will be approaching from this direction, carrying two companies, an American company from the 101st Airborne Division and an Iranian Airborne Company from His Majesty's Imperial Guard. Now these two companies, in just a matter of moments, will jump here, will move out into assembly areas and move up to reinforce Task Force Reza, which is part of Exercise Delaware, presently going on here in Iran. One United States and one Iranian company of airborne troops demonstrated the combat readiness of the United States and Imperial Armed Forces in a highly mobile combined operation. Together, the armies attacked across the rugged terrain, advancing toward the fictitious enemy. The drive and combat spirit shown emphasized the meaning of the code name for the exercise, Delaware, or Courageous. Sergeant Major Cosgrove talked with one of the helicopter pilots. It would seem that for the 101st Airborne Division, the key word in exercise Delaware is mobility, but you could very easily add a few more words and say air mobility of their own. This helicopter you see in the background belongs to the 101st Airborne Division from Fort Campbell, Kentucky. This is the pilot, First Lieutenant Leonard Kulik. 
Lieutenant Kulik and I have just returned from a mission to the 101st battle area in this exercise. And Lieutenant, will you explain what that mission was all about? Surely, uh, Sergeant Carsgrove, uh, we've been out reconnoitering an area through which we hope to mo move one of our maneuver battalions. The area is extremely rough and hazardous, and we have to know if the battalion can move safely and swiftly through that area. Lieutenant, just how did you get a helicopter of this size halfway around the world to Iran? Well, primarily we used an Air Force C-133. It was necessary to partially dismantle this helicopter. Mainly we took off one main rotor blade. Then the aircraft was uh, moved inside and chained down. The main rotor blade was wrapped in mattresses and secured to the deck of the aircraft, and it was flown here some 8,000 miles. Lieutenant, because this is unfamiliar territory, do you feel you're going to have any problem flying in this area? Yes, we do have a problem. Uh, we come, become very familiar with our own area, and that is one of the great advantages of this type of training. We are operating in a desert region that has uh, large mountains and continually blowing snow that offer many peculiar problems we don't normally have. Did you bring much other heavy equipment along with the 101st troop contingent? Uh, yes, we brought um, all supporting equipment that the normal airborne operation entails, and we brought an accompanying helicopter to this, and also spare parts, uh, fuel and oil, and uh, crew chiefs to maintain the aircraft that we have. Lieutenant, how long have you been flying helicopters for the Army? Well, I've been flying helicopters for the Army for a period of about six months now. Formerly, I was with the 101st in the jump status down with the 506th Airborne Battle Group. Getting back to this equipment again, Lieutenant, do you normally take your heavy equipment with you when you make an overseas move of this type? Yes, we do. We take all the equipment that we need to sustain ourselves in the field. Lieutenant, where's your hometown back in the States? Uh, my hometown is Chicago, Illinois. Well, I want to thank you very much for a very pleasant ride today, and also thank you for uh, the use of this uh, flight jacket. Thank you very much, Quite sir. Welcome. Later, United States and Iranian units operating in the Persian Gulf made a combined amphibious strike against the mainland. Iranian and United States naval officers worked together in directing the operation. Also, air support during the exercise was planned by United States and Iranian officers working in close harmony. United States F-100s took off in heavy dust for a ground support mission. They were followed by Iranian F-86s. Trained in the United States, the Iranians showed themselves to be fine pilots. The Iranian pilots spotted their targets and peeled off for the attack. Air control guided the planes to their targets. American F-100 strafed enemy positions on the final objective. After the strikes, the planes returned to Vodity Air Base. The final objective seized, United States troops and aircraft assembled at Vodity for the long trip back to the United States. Redeployment began at once, for the element of speed was important to the United States Armed Forces. Despite the unabating dust, the giant plane started to airlift men and equipment back to the United States safely and on schedule.
It's important to realize that for the first time in our history, an entire Army Airborne Brigade, with all of its heavy equipment, was air transported 12,000 miles on an allies call for assistance to help stem the tide of aggression in their country. United States military officials have devoted considerable effort to the evaluation of Exercise Delaware and its contributions to the defense of the free world. They believe that the success of the exercise has given a strong boost to the Central Treaty Organization. United States and Iranian fighting men have gained invaluable experience both in staff and command functions and in combined operations in the field. This combined effort helped prove that differences in language and customs need not be a barrier to allies working and fighting together in a common cause. Moreover, the exercise demonstrated that joint operating procedures enhanced the combat power of allied forces. The Delaware exercise helped strengthen the ties of friendship between the two countries. As for the United States Armed Forces, Exercise Delaware has furnished evidence of the effectiveness of the Joint Task Force concept, with its emphasis on teamwork among the Army, Navy, and Air Force. It is another demonstration of the ability of the United States Armed Forces to react swiftly to a call for help and to dispatch a strong, mobile fighting force to any part of the world in a matter of hours. We've shown you the planning, weapons, and materials that made this three-day exercise possible. But the spirit of close cooperation between the participating soldiers of both countries was the true significance of Exercise Delaware. Volatil Air Force Base, Iran, halfway around the world in the cause of freedom. This is Sergeant Major Donald Cosgrove, United States Army, saying goodbye from Iran for this week's issue of The Big Picture.